Now for the news in detail. The World Health Organization has declared the Americas the new epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, as Brazil reported over a thousand deaths in the past day. The U.S. has recorded 657 new deaths, raising the total to nearly 99,000. The global COVID-19 death toll has crossed 350,000 with nearly 5.6 million infections. This report has more. World Health Organization's Director for Americas, Carissa Atin, says the lockdown restrictions should not be eased as the region has over 2.4 million cases so far. In terms of total cases and deaths, Brazil is by far the most affected country in South America. But in terms of deaths per million people, Ecuador is worst affected. But as daily death count shrinks in U.S., many states, including California, have begun to reopen their economies after months of lockdown restrictions. I'll remind you, uh, we have statewide guidance modifications and we have these variances, these regional variances, uh, which have self-attestations, uh, people basically attesting at the county level, local elected officials and health officials attesting at the local level that they have containment plans and they have uh, plans to protect their citizens from the spread of this virus. While many countries have begun to ease lockdown restrictions, governments are focusing to produce COVID-19 vaccine at the latest. The UK has announced to provide antiviral drug Remdesivir to certain COVID-19 patients as clinical trials showed it could shorten the recovery time. Today I can announce that we're beginning a new trial for selected NHS patients of an antiviral drug called Remdesivir. There have already been some promising early results on coronavirus patients, with early data suggesting it can shorten recovery time by around four days. As you can understand, we'll be prioritising the use of this treatment where it will provide the greatest benefit. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia has announced to resume domestic flight operations from May 31st. Kingdom's Ministry of Human Resources says public sector worker will eventually resume work as normal as of June 14. Well, 28 more people have died from COVID-19 here in Pakistan, raising the total to over 1,200. The health ministry reported 1,446 new cases as the tally exceeds 59,000. The ministry said nearly 8,500 nationwide tests were conducted in the past day. It said 457 patients remain critical, while over 19,000 people have recovered so far. The ministry said the province of Sindh leads in the number of infections with over 23,000 cases. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has criticized the Indian government for posing a threat to its neighbors through its policies. In a series of tweets, Khan said the Modi administration is also a threat to Pakistan because of false flag operations. The Prime Minister condemned India's illegal annexation of occupied Kashmir in clear violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. He said the policies of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government are arrogant and expansionist. Khan said India has threatened Bangladesh through its Citizenship Act, as well as China and Nepal with border disputes. This comes as soldiers from India and China have indulged in skirmishes at least in three different sites on the line of actual control. Tensions between China and India are high in Ladakh and Nangkula Pass areas in the northeastern state of Sikkim. Well, to discuss all of that a bit further, we're now joined by the Foreign Minister of Pakistan, Shah Mahmood Qureshi. Mr. Qureshi, thanks very much for joining us here at Indus News. What do you think is Pakistan's take on the developing situation on the line of actual control between India and China? Look at now the situation in Ladakh. Now, who is responsible for this current standoff? Definitely India. When they know that this is a disputed territory, and they've had a skirmish between, uh, there's been a skirmish between India and Nepal in 19, uh, 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 and China in 1962. Then what was the need for new construction? Why are they building new roads there? Why are they building new airstrips over there? Why are they leveling all acquisition on China? China has always been a, a country advocating the peace and stability. China has never had any aggressive designs against any country. They're leveling charges, baseless charges, that 
they have moved aircrafts uh, into uh, forward bases that there are something like 10,000 uh, soldiers that have been, uh, and heavy equipment that has been uh, mobilized and, and, and uh, brought uh, towards forward positions. Baseless allegations. China is saying, listen, this is a disputed territory. We have sound mechanisms in place. Let's sit and resolve things through dialogue and through consultations. But India, to divert attention from the internal situation, which is deteriorating uh, in Kashmir, uh, the economic situation, which is rapidly deteriorating, and the mishandling of COVID-19, uh, and 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 uh, the 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 way uh, they are trying to promote Hindu nationalism as against uh, secular India, uh, is trying to. Uh, pursue uh, aggressive policies uh, to divert uh, local attention uh, and to seek international attention. This is a very dangerous game being played by India, and this can undermine peace and stability of the region. So, Foreign Minister Qureshi, what kind of communications right now are happening at a diplomatic level between Pakistan, China, Nepal, as well as other international bodies regarding these disputes that India has? Well, uh, just uh, before Eid, I had a, a, a long telephonic conversation with the UN Secretary General, and I informed him about the, the new situation in the Indian-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, the new steps that Indians had taken uh, to, uh, to bring about a demographic change uh, in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. I have written to the President of the Security Council, updating him on the latest situation. I spoke to the Secretary General of OIC because they are exporting Islamophobia now into Gulf countries. I have spoken to a number of foreign ministers uh, of OIC countries. I've spoken to a number of European foreign ministers uh, and I'm urging them to play a role for stability and peace because Pakistan right now is completely engaged to achieve peace and reconciliation in Afghanistan. We are concentrating on our western side. We do not want irritants on the eastern side. So help uh, play a constructive role. India is destabilizing the region. Tell them not to do so. Moving on with the news now, the Afghan government has released another 900 inmates as part of its pledge to free 2,000 prisoners in response to the Taliban's three-day ceasefire. In a tweet, Taliban spokesperson Sohail Shaheen said the move is a good step towards peace in the country. He added the Taliban would also free a significant number of Afghan soldiers soon. The prisoner swap between the two sides is pivotal to kick-starting intra-Afghan talks as enshrined in the Doha peace deal. Earlier at a press conference, National Security Council spokesperson Javed Faisal said the ceasefire must be extended to avoid bloodshed. In Saudi Arabia, six people have been killed and three others wounded in a shootout in the southwestern Asir region. Police said they have confiscated weapons and are investigating the incident. Officials said the wounded have been taken to hospital for treatment. They did not provide further details of the shootout in the region close to Yemen's border. Clashes have broken out between police and protesters in Hong Kong during demonstrations against China's proposed national security laws. Police fired pepper pellets and arrested some 80 protesters as the debate session on the bill is underway in Hong Kong's Legislative Council. People from all walks of life took to the streets in scenes reminiscent of the unrest that shook the city last year. Police cordoned off the Legislative Council's building amid soaring tensions over perceived threats to the city's freedoms. Earlier, U.S. President Donald Trump said he was considering stern measures against China before the end of the week. We're doing it now. We're doing something now. I think you'll find it very interesting, but I won't be talking about it today. I'll be talking about it over the next couple of days, John. Okay? But it's a very important question. Well, responding to Trump's remarks, China's foreign ministry said Beijing will take necessary countermeasures to foreign interference in Hong Kong. 
Well, China says its strategic confrontation with the U.S. has now entered a high-risk period. In a meeting with military leaders, China's defense minister Wei Fengye said Washington has intensified its aggression since the novel coronavirus outbreak. Wei said China needs to bolster its fighting spirit and use it to promote stability. Beijing's other military leaders said the country has to catch up with Western nations in developing futuristic technologies. PLA Air Force's arms chief Zhu Cheng said application of homegrown technologies is needed to win the war in cyber, space, deep sea and the biological spheres. The EU says China must respect Hong Kong's autonomy amid the controversy over Beijing's plan to adopt the national security law for the city. Speaking after a video conference, European Council President Charles Michel said the bloc attaches importance to the preservation of the city's high degree of autonomy. He said Europe supports the one country, two systems principle that governs Hong Kong. EU foreign ministers are expected to discuss that issue at a regular meeting on Friday. Meanwhile, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce said it is concerned over China's proposed legislation and has urged Beijing to de-escalate the situation. It's also called on the U.S. government to maintain constructive ties with Hong Kong. Well, China has urged Canada to immediately release Huawei's chief financial officer, Meng Guanzhou, and to allow her to return home safely. In a press briefing, Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian said the U.S. and Canada have abused their bilateral extradition treaty. He accused both countries of adopting coercive measures against the Chinese citizen. Zhao said Beijing is rock firm in its determination to safeguard the legitimate rights and interests of its citizens. He went on to say that Canada should correct its mistakes so that relations between Beijing and Ottawa are not damaged. Well, the U.S. has accused Russian jets of unprofessionally intercepting its Navy plane over the Mediterranean Sea. In a statement, the U.S. 6th Fleet said Russian pilots' actions were inconsistent with international flight rules and increased the potential for mid-air collisions. It said two Russian Sukhoi Su-35 fighter jets restricted the P-8A airliner's ability to safely maneuver away from the situation. The Navy said the Russian aircraft intercepted the maritime patrol and reconnaissance aircraft for over an hour. The statement said it was the third such incident in two months in the same area. The social media platform Twitter has prompted readers to check the facts in tweets sent by U.S. President Donald Trump. This comes as Trump claimed in a tweet that mail-in ballots would be substantially fraudulent and result in a rigged election. Twitter said it put a warning label in the tweet under its new policy on misleading information. The company's spokesman said Trump's tweets were related to election integrity and subject to different treatment under its policies. Trump has lashed out at the social media company, accusing it of stifling free speech and interfering in the 2020 presidential election. Lebanon's Hezbollah movement has rejected a U.S. request to empower a U.N. peacekeeping force patrolling the border with Israel. In an interview, Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah said with U.S. pressure, Israel wants the U.N. mission to have the right to raid private properties. Nasrullah said the U.S., as a result of Israeli demands, is raising the issue of changing the nature of UNIFIL's mission. He said Hezbollah is not against the presence of the U.N. mission, but the time of deeming Lebanon to be weak is over. Nasrullah said Israel cannot impose its conditions on the country, even behind an American mask. In August last year, the U.N. Security Council voted to renew UNIFIL's mandate for a year. However, on the U.S. insistence, the resolution included a requirement for the U.N. Secretary General to perform a mission evaluation before June 2020. I'll be back after this break with plenty more news. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. The UN Refugee Agency says humanitarian aid projects for war-torn Yemen are reaching a breaking point due to disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
The World Food Program said some $870 million are needed to continue the assistance for the next six months. In a virtual briefing, spokeswoman Elizabeth Byer said they expect the coronavirus to push many more children in Yemen into acute malnutrition. She said over 2 million children are already suffering from it. According to the UN Refugee Agency, around 80 percent of Yemen's population relies on humanitarian aid. Well, Russia says it will hold its World War II Victory Day military parade on June 24th. In a televised speech, President Vladimir Putin ordered Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu to begin preparations to hold the parade next month. Putin was forced to postpone Russia's May 9th Victory Day celebrations because of the deepening coronavirus crisis. Meanwhile, the country reported its highest ever daily death toll from COVID-19 with 174 new fatalities. The nationwide death toll from the virus has risen to 3,807, while infections stood at over 362,000. The UN says its officials will hold a virtual meeting with over a dozen world leaders on Thursday to discuss shoring up financial support for emerging economies. The meeting comes amid warnings the virus will cost developing nations more than the initially forecast $2.5 trillion to weather the crisis. In a virtual press briefing, the UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed said many developing countries lack sufficient funds to fight the pandemic and invest in recovery. Mohammed hailed the offer by the group of 20 major economies to suspend payments on bilateral debt for the poorest countries. She said it was a critical start, but further efforts would be needed. Out of the 77 eligible countries, only 22 have formally requested forbearance so far. Well, more than 60 nations have pledged over $3 billion in emergency aid for the 5 million Venezuelan refugees in the neighboring South American countries. The European Union, the UN, Spain, Canada and Norway organized the donors conference that was broadcast on YouTube. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, said the pandemic pushed Venezuela into a spiral of poverty and despair. The European Union's Foreign Minister, Joseph Borrell, said the EU has not forgotten Venezuela's refugee crisis. All aid proves that the European Union remains concerned about the situation in Venezuela and fulfills the commitment it had made to serve this conference. Thanks to the support, among others, of the government of Spain, we have proven that this is not a forgotten crisis, that we take into account the impact of the Latin American countries that we mobilized to support them and strengthen the international coalition that includes UN agencies and civil society. European stock markets are trading higher as investors are treading cautiously following escalating tensions between the U.S. and China. The recent tensions between the two countries have capped market optimism over economic reopening. CAC 40 in Paris is trading over 1.5% higher. Frankfurt's DAX has gained over 1% higher. London's FTSE 100 is trading over 1% higher as well. In Asia, the Nikkei 225 closed over half a percent higher, while the Shanghai Composite lost a fraction. Meanwhile, the international benchmark Brent crude oil price has lost over 1%. Latin America's Economic Climate Index has fallen to its lowest level in 31 years due to the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. This was revealed in a report by Brazil's leading economic think tank, Getúlio Vargas Foundation. The report said between January and April index for Latin America tumbled from negative 14.1 points to negative 60.4 points. The index has been in the negative numbers since April 2018, though it had recently begun to show a slight recovery. It said in all regional countries, a lack of innovation and consumer demand were considered important factors for economic performance. It said among other factors, corruption was identified as a key problem for nine of the countries, with the exception of Chile and Uruguay. France says it aims to become the top producer of clean vehicles in Europe. In a press conference, President Emmanuel Macron said he wants car makers to repatriate production from abroad and develop new models on French soil. 
To reach that aim, Macron said France will increase the state bonus for consumers buying electric cars to almost $7,700 from $6,500. He added no car model currently produced in France should be manufactured in other countries. Macron said the overall government measures to support the car industry would amount to some $9 billion. The British supercar maker McLaren Group says it will cut 1,200 jobs as it deals with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The firm employs around 4,000 people. In a statement, the company said the move is expected to impact jobs across the group's applied automotive and racing businesses. Motorsport events have been cancelled around the world due to the pandemic, which has shut car plants and closed showrooms. McLaren said it had been severely affected by the crisis. The company said it had worked hard to cut costs and avoid layoffs. For the latest updates on these and other stories, you can always follow us on our social media at Indus.com. Thanks for watching.